you all stand with us as we prepare for worship this morning. And even though it is a symbol of, of scorn to many, it's a, the symbol of hope for us as, as Christians. And I just ask you, Lord, as we just gather here this morning, as we just sing praises to your name, that you would just truly impress it upon our hearts that we would remember never to forget what it was that you did when you died on the cross for us. Lord, that the fact that you loved us so much when we're still yet sinners, that you're willing to come in, 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 as a, in human flesh human form to die for us, knowing at that time, Lord, that, that we may never love you in return. Lord, I just thank you for what it is that you've done for us, and I just ask you, Lord, that you would just use the, the love that you demonstrated to each one of us, that you would just draw us closer to you. And Lord, if there's anyone here that for the first time has never been drawn to you and never been willing to say, I, I give my life to you, Lord, that today would be the day. What better time than, a, than an Easter celebration, the, the time that, you, that we celebrate that you died for us, that we would 
all be willing to die for you and just to live for you as a result of what it was that you had done first to us. So, Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you and to celebrate what it was that you did for us. And we just lift up all of these things in the dear and precious name of Jesus. Amen. feel welcome this morning.
house of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen. 
the sea Nations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings Sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Oh, powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Storehouses laden with snow. Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable. Place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing. Several weeks ago, we went to snow camp, as many of you are aware of that, and uh, had a great time, and uh, 90 some kids there, and about a dozen adults. And uh, if, you, if you've been on Facebook at all, you've probably seen the video uh, from, from snow camp, a video, we had some pictures, and then we had a, a video of uh, some of the events that went on there, and pretty amazing, uh, I put that on Facebook, I think Friday, on the, on the Crossview Facebook page, and and I, by the next day, there were 700 and some people had seen it. It was pretty, pretty remarkable how quickly that can spread. But one of the things in the video that you may have noticed, if you've seen it, was that we did this Minute to Win It competition. And uh, one of the things that they, they did was they did the red solo cup stacking thing where you put them up into a, a pyramid. And some of the kids were really good at that. They could run them up really quick and then take them down really quick also. And then there were some that were not so good. And, and, and what would happen... And you've ever seen it even in, on, on TV, is that when, when something slips, if, you, if one cup falls, then they all fall. And, and that's what, exactly what would happen with some of the kids. The whole stack would just go on the floor, and they would be scrambling to pick them up. And as I, was, I was considering, I was reading the scripture this week and, and preparing for the message today. I was looking at the, the, the critical nature of the resurrection. That the resurrection, everything hinges on the resurrection. If the resurrection is not true, then the, the whole of Christianity collapses, much like the, the red solo cups. And, and so, as I was reading uh, 1 Corinthians this week, chapter 15, and looking at Paul, as he 
considers the gospel and he considers the resurrection, he is going to pretty much tell us up front that if this is not true, then nothing else is true. That, that the, the entire belief system will collapse under the, the, the stress of, of no resurrection. And so today as we, as we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, it is so important because it is the, the just important element of the whole gospel story. That if it is not true, then, then can we believe any part of it? And so... Paul believed that so true that, that he wrote to the Corinthian church about it. And it's, it is relevant to us today as we, as we consider the, the truth of the resurrection. Did Jesus really rise from the grave? And we're going to, to see Paul's words in that regard. Before we go any further, though, let's, let's pray together. Lord, thank you now that we have the privilege of, of reading your word, of hearing the truth of your of your gospel truth, Lord. And, and I would pray today, Lord, that you would help us to, to, to be particularly attentive to that, Lord, that it wouldn't slip by us, that, God, we would hear clearly and purely from you um, the great importance of this day, the resurrection of our Savior. Help us, Lord, to, to uh, not be distracted. Help us to, to be alert and wide awake, God, as we hear these these eternal truths, Lord, and what they mean for us today. Uh, we look forward to this time, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at the, the first verse, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Paul begins... By, by laying out the, the incredible truth of the gospel, the importance of the gospel, it is the gospel that you have been saved by. That's how important this is. It is what has resulted in your salvation. He's saying that to the, the church in Corinth, but he's saying that to you today also. And so he continues, he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried... And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believe. What he does is here, he, he summarizes the gospel. He presents to us the gospel and, and, and gives us the historical basis for the gospel. He, he, he lays out those who, who saw Christ after the resurrection. Those who witnessed him, who heard him speak, who, who laid their hands on him. He uses that to, to give us an historical perspective of, of the gospel. It's what saves us. It's what enables us to live, as Paul points out here. And so we're going to consider that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the structure, it's the foundation for everything we believe. All that we, if we consider the gospel as this building, this, this is what holds it all up. This is what saves us. This is what sanctifies us. And so we're going to, to consider that today as Paul's going to look at the possibility. He's going to hypothetically ask, ask some hypothetical questions or really a hypothetical question. You know, there are many battles in the, in the fight uh, here on earth as, as it relates to to God in the scriptures and, and creation versus evolution. But the one that carries the, 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 the most weight, the most power is the, absolutely the, the veracity of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. And, and so he's going to pull that one critical, most critical element of the gospel and he's going to question 
that is it possible that it's not true? And what is the implication? If the gospel, if Jesus did not resurrect, if he did not step out of the grave on that first Easter morning, what are the implications of that for the rest of the world? Then we're going to see that if that were the case, it collapses on itself. And so Paul begins by considering a question that we might be afraid to even ask ourselves. What, what if the resurrection is not true? What if this didn't really happen? What is the, what is the implications for, for all of the world and for us as believers if Jesus was not raised from the dead? You know, when those apostles, when those, those ladies first appeared at that tomb on Easter morning, they asked themselves this question. Is it possible? Is it, is it possible that he raised from the dead? And, and, and in, the, in their mind, they're thinking, no, it's not possible. That can't be the truth. And yet people today still will ask that same question. And so what is the, the implications of that? Well, look at verse 12. It says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the, the front line of, of the war in Christianity. And I don't mean war as in the, the secular war as we're, we're fighting with our, our culture. I'm talking about the, the eternal war that goes, that wages against our faith. The, the war that's being waged by Satan and has from the very beginning. And so the resurrection is the most critical battle line that's been drawn. You know, if I were to ask people, even people that don't come to church, people that aren't believers, I'd say, do you believe that Jesus existed? Most people would say, yeah, I believe that he existed. They might even concede that he was a, a good person, that he was a, a moral person. And, and if I were to say, well, do you believe Jesus died? They would say, well, of course he died, because all people die. And, and people would agree with that. I believe it's why we can, people will celebrate Christmas. People will have no problem celebrating Christmas, the birth of Jesus. And, and, and so we're all in agreement on that. In fact, if someone disagrees with that, if someone were to say to you, Jesus, well, Jesus never existed, they, they, you can't even take them serious. Because, because there is biblical historical record, and there's extra biblical historical record that Jesus Christ lived on this earth. That he was a real person who, who lived and walked this earth. And so, all of us can pretty much agree on that. Jesus lived. Jesus was born. Jesus died. But where the line is drawn is, was Jesus resurrected? Did he come to life again? And that becomes the, the point of disagreement. That becomes the point where the world and, and the church butt heads and say, that this, this is, it couldn't happen. Why do we say that? Well, we say that because we all understand what it means to be born. We were all born. We know, we've seen, we've had our children born. We've seen people be born. We know that last week there were some people that weren't in the world. And this week, there's some people that are in the world. Because they were born. We all will agree on that. And we all understand death because we've all experienced that in our, in our own life with people that are important to us. And yet... We don't know anybody that's been resurrected. We don't know anybody that was dead but is, is now alive. And so that becomes the heart and soul, the front line of Satan's attack on, on Christ and on the church. If it can be convinced that Jesus did not resurrect, that he did not come out of the grave, then there are some great implications for our faith. And that's exactly what Paul's going to look at. He's going to consider, what if it's true? What if this is not true? What if Jesus didn't resurrect? What are the implications for us? And, and so that is what is the, the basis for his, his, his uh, dissertation here, his talk to us. So is it important? Is it a hill worth dying on? Whether Jesus resurrected or not, well, it absolutely is. Because it is central. It is the main point. Everything that we believe as, as a church, as Christians, hinges on that truth. In verse 13 it says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, so Paul's going to hypothetically walk through this. He's going to say, okay, if this is not true, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your 
faith. So here's the first implication. If Christ was not resurrected, if on Easter, on that first Easter, he did not resurrect, if he did not come out of the grave, that it was true what the Roman soldier said, that he, his, his disciples stole him. If that was the case, then, if it is not true, then our preaching is without value. You know, people will even look at the life of Christ and say, well, you know, he, he was a good moral person. And so there's value. Even if you don't believe that he's God, even if you don't believe that he, he, he rose from the grave, if you don't believe that, then there's still some value in that. But Paul says, absolutely not. There is no value. He said, this is useless. We are playing a game if this isn't true. If, if Jesus did not step out of the grave on Easter morning, that first Easter morning, that all of this that we are doing is a charade. He said it's of, of no value. There, there's nothing good that is going to result from it. It is completely pointless if Jesus did not come out of the grave. But I believe that that isn't the case. I believe that the most important element of the church, the greatest responsibility is preaching and teaching what the Bible says. Teaching what, what God's truth is. That is the most critical thing that we do. It's the most important thing. And in fact, it says it's the gospel that saves us. It's the, it's, it's the gospel that sanctifies us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. God's word accomplishes all those things. And what Paul's saying is, if Jesus did not step out of the grave, then it doesn't accomplish those things. It is without value. The entirety of the Bible rests on the truth of Jesus' resurrection. And if Jesus did not rise, then all of our teaching, everything that we do is without value. And he continues in verse 15, he says, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. He's saying, you know, if that's not true, then we're lying. What we're saying isn't true. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. If, in fact, the dead are not raised, then the, 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 the great truth in that is this, that if Christ was not resurrected, then you and I will not be resurrected. We have this great hope of eternity. We have this great hope that, that we understand we're all going to die someday. We only have a, a little bit of time here on this earth, and, and at one point, that's gonna, time's going to run out. But we have this great hope that because Christ was raised from the dead, that we will be raised from the dead. And what Paul's saying is, if this isn't true, then it's not true for you either. If Jesus didn't step out of the grave, you are not going to step out of the grave. And that is horrific thought. And that is why the resurrection and the teaching of the resurrection is absolutely critical. The, the Bible tells us that we'll be resurrected someday. That someday we won't be here anymore, but we'll be somewhere. And if the Bible isn't true, if what Jesus is saying is not true, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, then then that's not what's going to happen to us either. It's a hypothetical question that he's raising. And what he's saying is, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, if Jesus did not step out of the grave, then you and I certainly aren't going to step out of the grave someday. And then verse 16 and through 18, it says, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And so, now he ties Jesus' resurrection with our sinful condition. He's saying, if Christ wasn't resurrected, if Christ did not step out of the grave, then you are lost in your sin. You are, are as, as lost as, as you could ever possibly be if it was not true that Jesus stepped out of the grave. If Christ was not resurrected, then we are unable to experience the forgiveness of our sins. That's the, the clear teaching of, of that passage. The resurrection of Christ is inter intricately tied to, to your forgiveness of sins. You know, I'm always struck by how many people, how people, no matter how 
nominal they may be in their faith. They might be just very superficial Christians that they aren't really that connected to Christ. They don't, don't have a, a, a real passion, a desire for God. And yet, I've yet to meet anybody. I've yet to meet anyone who doesn't want their sins forgiven. Everyone recognizes that they're sinful. Everybody can look at their own human condition and they notice that there's things about me that, that aren't right. I have this desire to do wrong things. And so everyone has in them this desire for forgiveness, to be, to be cleansed. When we were at snow camp this year, I, I shared a message on, we are talking about being fired up. And I shared on the, the, the fire that is Christ, and it says the fire of Christ purifies us. And, and, and I asked, how many of you want purified? How many people want cleansed of their sin? You know what? There wasn't anybody that was like, no, I don't think so. Everybody understands that. Everybody knows their, their, their sinful nature. And everybody wants forgiveness. And so we get that. And so Paul says that if Christ did not raise from the dead, then you cannot have your sins forgiven. In fact, he goes on to say in that verse that those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, are lost in their sins. That's the implication if Christ did not resurrect from the grave, you cannot be forgiven of, of your sins. We want to experience forgiveness of our sins. And Paul makes it clear that's only possible if Christ was resurrected. You know, the church so often focuses so much on the forgiveness of sin. You want to be saved? You want to be forgiven of your sins? And we all say, yeah, I want, I want that. And, and, and everybody's got their hand up. Everybody wants that sin removed. But, but we don't want that next step. I want cleansed. I want, I want purified. But I really don't want, I don't want this to be like a part of my life. I want this to actually overflow into other pieces of my life. I just, just clean me up and send me on my way. And, and, and Christ, and Paul tells us very clearly that that because of the resurrection, we can be cleansed. We can be forgiven. But without the resurrection, we can't. We cannot be forgiven. We cannot be cleansed. And so he says in verse 19, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. We come to the logical conclusion. If all of this is true, if it's true, that, that, that I'm not going to be resurrected someday because Christ wasn't resurrected. That I can't have my sins forgiven because, because Christ wasn't resurrected. If, if all of this is true, then the logical conclusion is this, and it is we have no hope. We are people without hope because Christ was not resurrected, and so all of these other things are going to follow with it that I will never experience a resurrected body. That's the logical conclusion. If Christ was not resurrected, if Christ did not step out of the grave, it's, this is the sum total. This is the consequence of, of that belief system. If our preaching is of no value, if we can't experience a resurrected body ourselves, if we cannot experience the forgiveness of sins, then we are a people without hope. It is a hopeless situation. And you might be thinking, Dan, you know, I usually come to church on Easter morning hoping for a little pick-me-up, something a little positive, and man, you are bringing me down today. And yet, verse 20 turns the whole thing around. It changes it from complete hopelessness to complete hope. Verse 20 says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's a big but. But, he put this, this hypothetical question, if Jesus was not raised from the grave, and then he says, but the reality is, he has raised from the grave. He has been resurrected. And so everything that we just talked about that wasn't possible has now become possible because Christ truly was resurrected. As I read that, I wondered if it, this is where the, the, the little saying we do on Easter morning, Christ, he is risen. He has risen indeed. That word is actually spoken there in that, in that verse. Because Jesus was resurrected on that first Easter, we all have the hope of a resurrected body someday. 
That's the truth. That is the reality of this. Since he was resurrected, I can be resurrected. I can be forgiven. I can, my, my preaching has a value. There is worth to what God's word says because Jesus was resurrected. You know, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Well, we share that truth that with other people. And what do they do with that? Well, I want to consider that today as we share this truth of the reality of Jesus' resurrection, the way people will respond, the way people will react to that is the same way that people have always reacted to that. And if we look at Acts chapter 17, verse 32 and thir- through 34, it says this, When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. And so when we, in, in, in Paul's day, when he was traveling across the, uh, Asia and, and sharing the gospel, and he said, he taught on the resurrection, he says, some of them sneered. Some of them heard that and said, you know what? That can't be. That's ridiculous. But it says this, others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. And this is what always happens. We present the gospel. We present the reality of the resurrection of Christ. And people are going to respond in one of three ways, actually. They're going to say, they're going to sneer. They're going to say, that's ridiculous. People don't rise from the grave. They're going to say, you know what? I'm interested in that. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about it later. Or they're going to believe. That's the only options. And, and my hope is that today, if there's anyone here who has never believed that today would be that day, that, that today would be the day when God speaks to your heart, reveals himself, reveals the reality of his resurrection to you, and that today would be the day that you believe, the day that you begin a new life in him with the knowledge of this, that someday you will be resurrected just as Christ was resurrected. That is our great hope. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you today for the great hope of this passage, for the great hope of the resurrection. The God today, we can rejoice because Jesus stepped out of the grave and someday we will also Step out of the grave into eternity. We thank you for that. Lord, as we close our time together today, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Savior, today, Lord, would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day that they believe. We thank you. And we pray these things all. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we are going to participate in in communion. We're going to receive communion. I want to briefly share why we, why we do that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. So why do we do communion? What is the purpose of communion? Just very briefly. First, it's an act of obedience. We do it because Jesus said, do this. It was his command to us. He told us to do that. So we follow through in obedience. The second thing he says that, It's an act of remembrance. Jesus said, do this to remember me. We are reflecting on his sacrifice, what he has done for us. And you might say, how could we ever forget something that huge? How could we ever forget his sacrifice, his life, his resurrection? Well, 
uh, if we're not reminded of that and the significance of that, we do tend to forget. And so it's not a, only a reminder of what he did, but to reflect on the incredible price that he paid. And so as you uh, join us in communion, remember the price that he paid, not for us collectively, but for you individually with his, his death on the cross and his resurrection. Also, communion is an act of proclamation. He says, whenever you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, many of you, I'm sure all of you, don't think of yourself as a preacher. But he says, when you are engaged in this, when you are eating the, the bread and drinking the, 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 the juice, that you are, in a sense, preaching a message. You are telling the world that you agree that you believe that Jesus is who Jesus said he was and that he stepped out of the grave on that Easter morning. Communion simply proclaims your faith in the work that, of Jesus and the cross. Communion is also an act of examination, and that is self-examination. It says in, in verses 27 through 29, everyone ought to examine themselves. And so as we prepare to do this, what Jesus is saying, what Paul is telling us, and Jesus said at that Last Supper, is that before you enjoy this meal, that, that you reflect on your life, does my life reflect on Christ? It, are the things that I'm doing in line with what God would want for me? And, and we, don't, we examine ourselves not to exclude ourselves we examine ourselves so that we can allow God to fix those things in our life, to make things right that need to be righted so that we can be a part of the, the communion. It's not a matter of your worthiness. We're all unworthy. It's a matter of allowing God to reveal the sin in your life and, and, and deal with that sin just very quickly and concisely here at, at, as you sit preparing to take communion. Our goal is not to prevent you, it's to allow you to be a part of this as God would intend for you to be a part of it. With that said, if the leadership would come forward and will pass the elements, it says that Christ invites all who repent of their sins, who place their faith in his person and the saving work of the cross, and who remain in the fellowship of the church to come to his table. We do so looking back with thanksgiving for his atoning death on the cross to forgive our sins, as well as looking forward with anticipation to his promised return for his bride so we can celebrate together the Lord's Supper. So we invite all who know Christ and are part of his church to participate with us in his presence.
Came flesh for my sin and death. Now you're risen. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross when your love poured out.
this message today was that we have the hope of a resurrected body ourselves because of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. If Jesus resurrected from the grave, then we also can have that same experience. As we close today, we're going to sing of that. We're going to sing of that resurrection, that great hope that we have because of this Easter morning many years ago. As we sing that today, reflect on that truth for your life, the peace and the joy that you have as a result of the knowledge of the resurrection that you will experience someday.
Friday evening, the reality of this song, the song became real to her. She experienced the, the resurrection of, of life for the, for the believer. And, and, and I, as I, I talked to Missy, who Missy comes to church here yesterday morning, I, I could sense the absolute hope, the absolute certainty in her heart of, of that reality. And that is the hope that she has. That's the, the, the joy that she can experience even in, in horrible, difficult times like that. And the truth is that that's the hope that's available to all of us. But it is only available to us because the grave was empty. Because Jesus truly stepped out of the grave on that first Easter morning. And we now have the opportunity to step out of the grave ourselves someday. Just because Jesus already did. You know that says that he is the first fruits and that carries the meaning of a of, of a ticket that's paid the way for everybody that follows, for those who believe the resurrection that will be real someday for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the joy it's been to fellowship together. Thank you, God, for the, the, the privilege of looking at your word and seeing the great hope that's contained in it. Lord, we thank you that the grave was empty on that day. And because of that, Lord, you have made a way possible for all of us here today to come to be with you in eternity someday. We thank you for that. Help us, God, to faithfully walk each day in that hope. We thank you, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a just a blessed Easter today.